Brother Gene's going to be talking about not loving the world, love not the world, is his topic. In preparation before that, um, I wanted to speak a few words about um, the, the children of Israel. Uh, Brother Mike just gave a little quick summary over just some of the things that God did in leading them. Just as God led these children of Israel, he's leading us as well to our eternal home. And he had very specific laws to follow while they were on this journey. When they did not heed his words, there were serious consequences, too. For those in Christ, there are also instructions designed to enable you to make it to the other side. He has already helped us in many different ways. In Brother Given's lesson the other night, he said, Men must learn to place a high value on what the Lord says. If he warns men, it is to be taken seriously. Amen. With this in mind, that's how we need to think of, of these warnings, and this one in particular that uh, Brother Gene's going to expound on. John writes that all that is in the world is appealing to the flesh, and that the world is temporary and passing away. In light of that, that ought to make us think very differently about things, not holding on to things tightly and such as that. Some things in the world are obviously overt evil practices that you may not be taken in by very easily. You'd be repelled from. But Satan is so cunning that he presents other things with an innocent-looking allure in the beginning but are capable of spiritual death. Our Lord's better offer he holds out is to do the will of God and live forever. That's the opposite side of the coin there. John writes about these things to people of all ages and in varying stages of their growth in their faith. He knew they had faith, which was why he was able to talk to them. This would enable them to receive this word. If they hadn't had faith, it would have fallen on deaf ears. So I want to read those as introductory scriptures to his uh, sermon today. This is uh, verses 13 and 14. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Now, his sermon text is uh, the seven, 15th to 17th. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Amen. Our brother John, I appreciate brother Michael's comment earlier about John in this first epistle expounding upon the love of God and driving this home, nailing this down for us, so to speak, about uh, that, that, that the believers would uh, have a greater and a, a more foundational, uh, would, well, I shouldn't say it that way, I should say they'd be more firmly connected to this foundation of the love of God, the greatest the greatest of these, I appreciated last evening our, uh, in our uh, exchanges and uh, the observation about that love is, is an essential part of God's nature. <laughs> Whereas faith and hope are, part of the, are, are among the instruments, if you will. It's part of the instrumentality of God drawing us and bringing us to himself and working in us and affirming the things that he intends in his people. As Sister Debbie mentioned, these words here are addressed to those who are willing, uh, those who are eager to do, to respond to the things that they've heard. They've been responding. Uh, they've believed these things. They've yielded themselves to the truth. They have let, they have let this truth have its course in them uh, to, uh, and are continuing to do so. He speaks of the, these uh, uh, different levels of maturity. Some are, some are less mature, some are more mature, uh, but they're all making progress together. So that's why he could speak to them in this way. And yet he did need to speak to them <laughs> because, of the, because of the 
abundance of delusions that are in the world. And brethren, I would remind you, you already know this, that if they had an abundance of delusions, what have we in this generation, in the last uh, however many generations you want to count, especially as, as the inventions of men seem to have increased, also the inventions of men doing evil and wickedness with those things have increased. The capacity, it's, it's, it's stunning how the, the capacity of, of uh, evil and wickedness in the human heart, the depths and the lengths and the breadth and breadth and the height of it, it's just stunning. People, private things that are eventually uncovered, tragic, unspeakable things. Things about which the Apostle Paul has said, it's not right to speak about them in the assembly of the saints. And so we won't. You know what we're talking about. And then there are the public things that seem to be proliferating in our generation. Things that were unthinkable uh, 25 years ago taking place on a mass scale often. Stunning. And of course... The answer for many is to point fingers at someone else. <laughs> you know, it's not their fault. It's not their fault. Find some rationale for it. And instead of us, instead of men addressing the issue of evil and wickedness itself, as the scriptures do, that's within a man. It's within a man. It's within every individual, see. So this is why the apostle had to urge the believers, his readers, to be vigilant and alert externally, but also within. In fact, these words speak volumes about the internal vigilance, don't they? Yeah. They sure do. There's no truces, no treaties, no white flag for the godly. No surrender, see? No compromise with the world and the flesh, the enemy of our soul. We've, we've been rescued. We have fled for refuge Amen. from the wrath that is coming. See, all of these, all of these statements in Scripture making, make us aware, yes. remind us. They're all written to believers, by the way, so, and they just, they're reminders to us from different, from different aspects, from different points of view, what we continue to deal with. As we pass through this present darkness, this dark world, but we are sons of the day and sons of the light. Our brother reminds us we don't walk in the day, and our destiny is not destruction, but salvation in the presence of our God. So the Apostle John, our good brother, commands then, Lifts up our heads. Love not the world. He commanded the affections. He commanded the desires. He commanded the attention of the believers. When we use the phrase, pay attention. See, that's what we're talking about, paying. What you, what you give yourself to. How you use your resources. That's what he's talking about. Here. Love not the world. The personal resources, uh, your thoughts, your time. Your body, eyes, ears, hands, feet, voice. And you're using those right. instruments. What's Paul, our brother Paul say? The instruments of your body, mm -hmm. the parts of your body. Mm -hmm. Give them to him as instruments of righteousness. Amen. David said he had set his affection on the house of God. And he directed his son, Solomon, to set his affection, his attention toward the Almighty. Seek him, he said. He will let you find him. If you do not, there was a warning there, wasn't there? If you do not, he will reject you. Yeah. So men do set their affection on what they seek and treasure what they intended and what they intend to obtain. 
Now, our brethren who followed the Savior, the twelve, they left. Some of them, we know what they left. Family businesses, uh, personal security, Matthew working for the government, great security. You know, you can work for the government or not work for the government, still get paid. That's pretty good security, huh? Well, we've all heard about that in the last few weeks, huh? Matthew left that. He got up. He got up from his table and left. Followed after him. Put all that behind him. Amen. Invited, invited his co-workers, people that he had associated with in the past for a farewell meal, but also an, inter- an introduction meal. Huh? Right. Right. I'm leaving you all. This is what I'm leaving you for. Yeah. Can you imagine sitting in that room and hearing and seeing those things that night? Uh, stunning, stunning. So they left. They left those things. Some left John the Baptist. Wow, that's a, that's really, that's a stunning thing, to leave the prophet. All of Israel, Judea, all Judea, gone out to see him, hear him preach. The religious authorities in Jerusalem, flocking down there to say, "What's going on here? Who are you?" Where did you come from? Where did you get? To? Why are you baptizing on? He stirred up so many people. They had no clue where this man came from. Uh, some of them might have remembered the connection to Zechariah. We don't, we don't know how prominent Zechariah was in the ranks of the priests. It wouldn't have been hard for them to find out that connection. If, if John had been gone, maybe you know he was about 30 years old himself. Perhaps he'd been out of the public eye most of his life, if not, if not all. But they could have, uh, if he had mentioned his father's name. Oh, oh. And he, he became very prominent, but they left. They left him. Lord, where are you staying? One word. Behold the Lamb of God. One word, they, they believed what he said, and they understood that what he was saying to them was to direct them to this man. This man. Later on, of course, he would say to other disciples, I told you, he must increase, I must decrease. I am the friend of the bridegroom. So some, fo- some left and followed, some did not. They, they all left families. Their families didn't travel with them at that point. There was one statement about Peter's having a a believing wife. Beyond that, there's no mention of any families, is there? Not one mention. Well, there was the other one about Peter's mother-in-law when the Lord visited there. That's the only time they're mentioned. For for those of us who emphasize family. Hmm. So... Yet there were others who spoke like this to the Savior when he was here and thought they could divide their affections. That's what we're talking about here. Love not the world. We're talking about dividing your affections. They said, uh, I will follow thee, but first let me go bid farewell, which are at home at my house. Now some would say, well, Matthew did that. Peter was back at his house. Well, Jesus didn't say the same thing to everybody, did he? No, he didn't. He said, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Love, not the world. This is not the only statement the master made on this, in this vein. He gave them a sober, sober word about counting the cost. If any man come to me, And hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also. He cannot be my disciple. He made it very plain, didn't he? Now, the enemy of our soul will hide. He will, what we call, bait and switch, won't he? Oh, look what you can get. And then, oh, this is what you really get. See, that's, that's, that's the way it is in the course of this world. And John is warning us. That's, that's, see, he's going to say, to, that's what, don't love. Don't love these things. Don't love them. 
Here's some amazing and wrenching words about focus and loving not the world. Demas hath forsaken me, Paul said. Having loved this present world. These worlds almost, (laughs) you couldn't get much closer to a quote, could you? Love not the world, this present world. Having loved this present world. That's how he described Demas. Now, we don't know what it was. You know, we have the, uh, we have the record of uh, Mark, of course, in fear. It, it appears, looks like it was fear because of the, uh, the confrontation with, with violence over the preaching of the gospel there in, uh, in Pisidia. Was it worldly affections? Well, we don't know. Except that Paul said he loved this world. It was worldly affections, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we just don't know the details. Isn't it amazing how many details we don't know yeah. about events that are recorded in Scripture? Pardon me. Yeah. So the master stated this kingdom principle, which we know very well. We cite it again and again and again. This is a reality, by the way. It's not a commandment. It's just a statement of this is the way things are. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Love not the world. See? So he spoke these words to those who submitted to the obedience of and to faith. Both of those phrases are used in Paul's letter to the church in Rome. He had fully preached the gospel to them. He said, in fact, he said to them, I dare not to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, because he loved not the world, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and far round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Well, these believers that John's writing to, they'd heard these things. They'd heard these same things, the same message had been declared to them, they believed it, and it was working in them, and so John is now arming them further and stabilizing them and strengthening them for the tasks ahead. He knew the tasks ahead would be difficult on some level, that they would have to deal with all kinds of opposition. So he says, love not the world, neither the things in the world. The world we know from scripture is a it's a system of ungodly thought, word, and deed. That is itself the broad and crooked path upon which the damned walk. So this is a warning. James gives this warning. It's already been cited once or twice today. The adulterers and adulteresses, now these were believers he's speaking to, let me remind you. The adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? That's a rhetorical question. They knew the answer to that. Those are kind of, that's kind of an ugly way to address believers, isn't it? Adulterers and adulteresses? Well, I've, I've never called anybody that. I've been, I've been reprimanded for saying less than that. Much less than that. Well, I've, I've, been a, I've been reprimanded for not calling names. When I, when I said things, I didn't do any name calling. I just spoke, some, and I was reprimanded for it. Many of you have been as well. In the church, corrective statements, challenging statements, Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. That's a conclusion for you. Huh. In your face, as we say. Two before to get your attention. <laughs> Comfortable religious people. Adulterers and adulteresses. Do you suppose he said that in a friendly, kind manner? If, if it was spoken, we know it was written. How, how do you suppose the readers of his letter took that? 
the, you know, the tone of these words. Hey, suppose they understood the tone of these words. I would think that they understood them uh, in a pretty firm manner. Yeah. No nonsense. It's the get your attention things. What this is, see, with, this is serious business. We're not we're not talking about buying comfortable pews here, and having having pleasing paint on the wall and comfortable carpet under your shoes. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the world that wants to destroy you, a system of thought and ideas that will take your life. That's what we're talking about. That will, that will draw you away from God, and you will end up in the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. You will end up there. That's what he's telling the believers. This is serious. This is serious. In our, and we know, don't we? that in most congregations, or a lot of congregations, the congregations that we've been, if, if you spoke this way there, you would be, you might be removed from the pulpit on the spot. You would likely be removed at the end in order that they wouldn't, because they don't want public confrontation, see, so they just remove you later. If you spoke this way in a lot of congregations... I've had the experience where in some congregations they want you to, to speak harshly. It makes them feel good, but there's still no response. It's, it's the old, I like to have my toes stepped on once in a while, you know. <laughs> They're not taken seriously either, see. They're not at all. There's no change. Let me read you some words. Now, these are just a few of John's words in his gospel. Words that he recorded. Well, they're, they're actually all statements. No, not all of them. A couple of them are conclusions that, that John drew. Most of them are statements the Savior himself made, recorded in his gospel. And I, I cite these to draw this contrast between our Savior and the world. Love not the world, neither the things in the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. See, that's why the world's dangerous to us, too. It knew him not. You think it's going to know us? In the sense that this is meant, in the sense that this is meant uh, recognized, recognize, have fellowship with, welcome, be, be comfortable with, want to associate and affiliate themselves with you? No, they will not. And Brother Michael cited the, that incident there in Simon the Pharisee's house. I didn't bring it up then, but I'll bring it up now. How was that received? Jesus is sitting at this man's table. And he says these very offensive things in, in, any, in almost any kind. He was a guest there. You did not treat your host this way, did you? Well, not unless the subject matter was really serious, you didn't. And, of course, it was. In religious environments, you surely don't. Now, now among the Pharisees, it may have been different. I, I don't know for sure. I, uh, they may have been pretty aggressive about these things. They may have been, you know, Paul certainly was. He wouldn't back down, would he? Not before, not after. He confronted Peter there in Galatia. You're not being honest about the gospel. He wasn't afraid that Peter walked with the Savior. He wasn't afraid that Peter had been given the keys to the kingdom. This was serious business. Paul took it. He'd always been serious. So serious that he had hunted for Peter. Before Damascus, if, Peter, if, Paul had found, if Saul had found Peter, it would have been the end for Peter. If he'd found him, if he could have gotten his hands on him, it's likely he pursued him on more than one occasion. Paul was serious before and after. He, d he was always serious. That's why he could say what he said. I've served God in all good conscience to this day. Yeah. Well, these words are urging us. See, this is a warning. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming to him and saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. See, the world's full of sin. Yeah. He's taking it away. And the truth is, a lot of people don't want it taken away, do they? Now, they, they'd like to have the effects of it taken away. 
but they don't want the sin itself. Some of them glory in it. They glory in their shame. Look at this. Ha, ha, ha. In all kinds of ways. I'm, I'm smarter than you are. I'm stronger than you are. I'm, and on and on it goes. This is the way the world reasons about these things. But he came to take away the sin of the world. See, he was not in fellowship with it. He did not agree with it. And it wasn't long before they realized <laughs> he's not going to cooperate with us. He's not going to do what we want. Even the lost house of the lost sheep of the house of Israel realized that, didn't they? And of course, later on, the apostles would have this label: <laughs> "Those who have turned the world upside down have come here also." See, they're, they're 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 not conforming to what we want. They're not going along. They're not fitting in with the rest of the religious world. The Romans. It was their custom. Just Sure, just come right on. Bring your God with you. We've got a whole house full of them here. You're welcome. You just respect everybody else like we respect you, okay? You don't say anything mean or nasty to anybody now. We're coming to that place. We surely are here in America about these kinds of issues in some houses of worship or what are called that. In some places where people claim to be believers, we're coming to that place. If you come in there and speak certain things, mm, you're out. You're not welcome here. You get out. We're coming to that place. We know that he came not to condemn. This is what John said here. God sent not a son in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. They needed to be saved. See, they're not like God. They're alienated from God. They need to be saved. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world where it's dark, see. And men loved darkness rather than light. That's already been mentioned today because their deeds were evil. See, there is a stark contrast between the ways of this world and the ways of our God. And Jesus came as light. And walked in the darkness and he forced men to see the reality of these things in himself. First it was Israel. First it was Judah. The, pe- the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They were forced to make this decision. See, The bread of God is he that cometh down and giveth life to the world. Because the world doesn't have any life in itself. See. The world cannot hate you, but it hateth me, because I testify. See this separation between him and the world. I am not of this world. For judgment, I've come into this world. Why? They they needed to be judged. There is something called right and wrong. Now, the world will tell you that, won't they? But, of course, they want to be the arbiters of right and wrong. They will not allow God to do that. They will not. Some claim that they do, but it's only because they don't know the righteousness of God. If they knew the righteousness of God, which has been demonstrated in his own son, they would run for refuge into it, if they really knew it. Some who get a little glimpse of it draw back in horror at the thought. They reject, refuse to retain these things. There's all kinds of reactions. See, but he came for judgment. He revealed that he who loves his life shall lose it. He who hateth his life in this world shall keep it to life eternal. Hate your life in this world. Mm -hmm. And now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. There is no fellowship between the savior of the world And this world, there is none. Many preachers speak like it is, like there is. In fact, in a lot of fellowships, if you don't have fellowship with the world, you're disobeying God. See how the light has been turned into darkness and darkness into light. They go to extreme extents to urge you to get out there, get outside these four walls. The 
poster plaque, however you want to describe it, that's over many doors on the inside. Remember? Out, past through these doors, there's a mission field out there. There's the mission field out there. Yeah. That, that's the focus. That's the emphasis, see? You've got to have this connection with the world. But we hear the Apostle Paul asking these questions. What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What, what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said. And he quotes from Isaiah. I will dwell in them. I'll walk among them. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. This is the call. See, this is part of the call. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing. I will receive you. Remember the text from last Lord's Day evening. Touch not the unclean thing. Touch not the unclean thing. I will receive you. I will be a father unto you. Ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. See the distinction? The separation here. Holiness, we understand that's holiness, sanctification is a process of bringing us to holiness. We are in a, currently in a generation that worships love of itself as the premier human emotion. Love not the world. As I, I, I mentioned this yesterday, there, there, are, there are many who would, who would uh, agree with our theme, the greatest of these is love. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. But it's their definition. See? And the objects of it, the objects of it is just whatever they please it to be. Unless, of course, they're not pleased with it. Then they can make a judgment. There are, certain, there are still a few things that by the, uh, the, the, by the weight of... Uh, uh, public opinion that are still evil. A few things. But there are cracks in it, brethren. There are cracks in it. I could name it. They demand the right to choose whatever object pleases them, whatever they have an appetite for. They demand that. And they glory in it in themselves. And if you associate with them, probably sooner than later, you will have to conform or they will not associate with you. You will be branded. You will be labeled as evil, as a hater. You'll be labeled as a hater. And your speech will be hate speech, won't it? Yeah. The nominal church robes themselves in all kinds of religious psychobabble, of course. They've been doing that for a generation or so. Under the heading of, as has already been mentioned, under the heading of that we ourselves are the primary object of the love of God. There's nothing that God would not do. No length to which he would not go. And they point to the cross when they say that. They point to the cross when they say that. That God just wants to... Well, I read this week of a group that calls themselves the Affirming Church. Now you think about where that probably leads, and you're right. They want it to be known publicly that they affirm people. Who is it right now that is demanding to be affirmed in our culture? Even in the churches. Especially in the churches. Yeah. Leaders of the churches. It's exactly what it is. See? You can't go very far. If you have this view that you need to love people, first of all. The revelation of God is, though, that he, is, that he does act and he has always acted, first and foremost, 
for his name's sake. Now, there are not very many people in the churches that, that hear that phrase or understand it when it's said, for his name's sake. See, that, that ties right into this command, love not the world. Now, he gives us a couple of reasons why not to. The first one is primary. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. God will not love you. That's what he's saying. He will not. There is no coexistence. How many times have you seen that bumper sticker around town? Coexist? With the little symbols in it? Yeah. Coexist. There is none as far as... Now, the world pretends on some level to do that. But they know. They don't. They wouldn't coexist with us. Not at all. They would not give us a... If they could, they would remove any platform for us to speak. If they could. One cancels out the other. The lordship and the glory of God is unbendable, unadaptable, and undeniable in its agenda. I, even I, am the Lord, and besides me there's no savior. I have declared and have saved. I have showed when there was no strange God among you. This is said to Israel by the prophet Isaiah. No strange God among you. Therefore, ye are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Yea, before the day was, I am he. There is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? I, even I, am he that blotteth out your transgression for my own sake. See, that's key. That's the biggest phrase in all of those. For my own sake, he says. Not for your sake. For my own sake. Now, we benefit, certainly. But it's first for God. And will not remember thy sins. And then, of course, the Father has transferred all judgment to the Son now. He's the one who did the saving in the body, in the earth, in himself. He's the one who did the saving. And he said these words. The loving and affirming and accepting Jesus. See, that's how people describe him. You all are familiar with these words. He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth. Now, of course, to understand those words correctly, you have to know the real Jesus. All of him. Not just the parts that are pleasing and comfortable to you, but all of him. The one that sat there at that table in Simon's house and stripped Simon of all his pretense and exposed him to himself and everyone else in the room. Can you imagine the things that were said by people who left that room? How it got all over town, what he said? Well, religious men don't speak that way. Rabbis don't speak that way to each other, do they? Surely not. Well, maybe they did. If, if they were a recognized enemy, maybe they did. But Jesus was sitting as a guest at this man's table. He had eaten this man's food. And to speak that way to him, to call him those names... Well, Jesus' little sentence parable here, after he says, he that is not with me is against me, this, this two-sentence parable reminds us of the, of the, the reason for this and, and what's really at stake here. When he says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry, pla- dry places seeking rest, finding none, he saith, I'll return to my house from which I came out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This is why this is so serious. Yeah. Because evil and wickedness and those who lord it over the ways of this world they are predatory after your soul and when he cometh he found it swept he findeth it swept and garnished goeth in 
and taketh with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. There's a hierarchy, you see. They entered in. Dwell there. The last state of the man is worse than the first. Compromise. The Savior said, no man can serve two masters. No servant can serve two masters. He will either hate the one, love the other. He'll hold to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Again, Jesus told the truth, the whole thing, as much as they could bear. It, it was all in there, wasn't it? It could be expounded further, but the whole truth was right there of these things that we're speaking about. While the prince of this world baits and switches an unattainable and elusive prize, you can't have it anyway. He just makes you think you can. He just makes you think it's pleasing, young people. He just makes you think it's pleasing. Amen. Now, I have, I have not lived the godless, wicked life that a lot of people I associate with have. People that I associate with at work. People that have to come and work for me. I've not been a drinker. I've not mistreated my wife. I have people come work for me who've mistreated their spouse. For various reasons. All those kinds of things. I see all these kinds of things. Drug activity. They come and associate. You know. When I was young, I didn't do the things that the kids that we teach every week did. I didn't do those kind of things. But I know what they are. I did do some things that just wasn't quite as deep. I was spared, you see. Most of the time, I was just afraid. I was timid and afraid. I said things that got me into trouble. I just said things that got me into trouble, and that protected me from other things. But you don't have to. You can learn. You can learn to love not the world. You don't have to. You don't have to have passed through the sludge and get it on you and be stained in more ways than one. You know, he, he cleanses, he does cleanse, but it still leaves there's there is a there is a, a memory. We have a memory. We have a memory. So James again James says this about this. Love not the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. A double-minded man's unstable in all his ways. This love for God is the aim and focus. See, the love for God, not not just other people. We love Him first, then we love, then we love others. His love is born in us by His nature as His children. It has an appetite for righteousness, goodness, and truth, and excellence that. That excludes anything. It, it just automatically excludes whatever interferes, whatever interferes with it. Many know James' words about pure religion, undefiled before the fathers, this, visiting widows and orphans. Lots of people talk about that, don't they? Few finish that sentence. And to keep himself unspotted from the world. Not many expound that, in my understanding. So our brother states for us the exclusive nature of the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. All that's in the world, he says, here's, an, here's the last reason, all that's in the world, these things, these things that will pass away, a whole system of values, interests, appetites are cursed of God, they're corrupt, they are, ens are enslaving, and they lead to destruction. If you have bitter envy, James again says. If you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. Lie not against the truth, he says this to believers. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. And he goes on and describes it. Paul describes it in other places. Men destroy themselves. The people in the world, they're, they're, they're destroying themselves right now, thinking that they can indulge these things with impunity that they can touch on them, that they can, and then free themselves. <laughs> but, of course, they become ensnared, and then after a while, they don't care to free themselves, do they? 
In fact, they think, many of them think, I can't live without this now. I've got to have it. It becomes my life. It is my life. I'm not anything else. And we'll tell you that, see? They don't know its power and its end. As Paul says here in Romans 6, Know ye not that ye to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience unto righteousness. They don't know these realities of the flesh. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. To be carnally minded is death, he says. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. They that are the flesh cannot please God. They don't know these processes that every man is tempted, James says, when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. When lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. See, people that are given to the world and the flesh don't know these things. You learn these things on the inside. You you young people, you're learning these things now. The word of God. This is the truth. This is a reality. You don't have to have indulged in these things to the extent that you become completely enslaved like many do. You don't have to. You can be free. Remember what our brother Peter said when the Lord Lord, that sheet down full of unclean animals. Yeah. Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. Mm-hmm. Oh, to be able to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Or something, something along that line. Yes. Amen. To be able to say, I've never done that. Yes. Yeah. See? Amen. Old cultures and societies lay in ruin. No longer exist because of the fruit of these corruptions. Mm-hmm. And then... The inhabitants went to meet God. You think their destruction on the earth was bad? Then they went to meet God. Fear not him who after he's destroyed the body can do no more. Then their appetites for those things entered into a realm where there was nothing for them. Nothing. But they still had the appetite that they had cultured and grown and fed and loved and yielded themselves to and enslaved themselves to their whole lives. Now there's nothing. Nothing. But everlasting frustration and the gnashing, the gnashing of teeth, the gnawing of the worm and the gnashing of the teeth. Peter describes these things in this way. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat. They'll be destroyed in this manner. The earth and also the works that are therein shall be burned up. The heavens and the earth which are now by the same word, see this word of God, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You see, brother, we're not talking about just concepts and precepts when we talk about the world. We're talking about men. It's not abstract. The trees are not going to lead you into corruption, okay? The rocks are not going to allure you into immorality. It's men. The world is in them. It appeals to them. The course of this world, it's in men who don't believe, in whom is an evil heart of unbelief. And they go down and down and down, and it just keeps going. We don't know the depths. Thank the Lord that we don't know the depths. Bless God that we were able to escape before we got very far down deep because we were all in it. God just... Snatched us from the fire. Snatched us from the pit. Snatched us from the whirlpool, didn't he? Yeah. He concludes then, our brother Peter concludes by asking a most reasonable and logical and rhetorical question. You know it. Seeing then 
that all these things shall be dissolved. He's agreeing with John, see? John's agreeing with him. We don't know which one wrote first. What manner of person ought ye to be in holy conversation and godliness? We know the answer. Brethren, love not the world. For we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is in the world, so also are we in this world. Love not the world. God's grace and peace, brethren.